everybody. My name is Dolores Arudin and I'm the director of UCD's Institute of Food and Health. And I'm delighted to see so many of you joining us this evening for our Nutrition and Health Public Health Lecture Series. So these lecture series are designed to give the public evidence-based examples of what is important to you from a nutrition and from a dietary point of view and in the broader specter of the food that we consume. And tonight's talk is going to be on food processing and typically the public have negative connotations associated with food processing. So tonight we're going to challenge that as you can see in the title, which is food processing and what are the benefits. The talk is going to be jointly delivered by Professor Jim Link with expertise in food science and technology and Dr. Breach McNulty, whose expertise is in the nutrition area. And I'll hand you over to my colleague, Professor Lorraine Brennan, who will further introduce the speakers and then we'll get started. So over to you, Lorraine. Thank you very much, Dolores. It gives me great pleasure tonight to introduce our two speakers. So first up, we have Professor James Ling. Jim is a food scientist and head of food science and nutrition section at UCD. He's a professor of food science and he lectures and researches in food processing technology. He is particularly interested in the use of new and emerging technologies for processing food in a more sustainable manner while retaining product quality and nutritive value. He'll be joined, as Dolores said, by our colleague, Dr. Breach McNulty, who is an assistant professor in human nutrition in UCD. Breach leads the National Food Consumption Surveys in Ireland, and these surveys collect detailed dietary data and lifestyle data spanning from one-year-olds to right through to 65-year-olds. Breach's main research interests are in using this data to gain an understanding of the impact of nutrients, food ingredients and chemicals on health with a view to underpinning food safety and policy. So I'm delighted that both of them agreed tonight to talk on this very topical subject. So I'm going to hand over to Jim, who's going to start off. Thank you very much, Lorraine, for the uh, introduction uh, to this presentation on the benefits of food processing. Um, as Lorraine has said, we're going to deliver this presentation in two parts this evening. In the first part, I'll start off with a brief overview of the role and benefits of food processing technology and then I'll hand over to Breed, who will give uh, nutritional perspectives on food processing. I suppose to start, my area of interest and expertise is in the field of food process technology, and it's the area I lecture in, and it's also, as Lorraine has said, the area I do my research in. And in the field of food science, um, food process technology is an area that's really well understood, very well defined. As you can see from the slide here, there are numerous textbooks written on the, on the, on the topic, well in excess of 100, I'd say. And there are numerous dedicated scientific journals publishing hundreds of peer-reviewed papers every year on this topic. The term food process technology is very much associated with the physical aspects of food manufacture or unit operations. And in any food science program in anywhere in the world, you'll find uh, you know, a, a module or modules called food process technology, and they're designed to underpin the commodity-based modules. So modules like milk and dairy products, meat and meat products, plant products, food ingredients, they're underpinned, generally speaking, by a module or series of modules in the area of, of food process technology. The difference being that these commodity modules focus more on the chemical and biological aspects of food manufacture, whereas food process technology focus on the physical. The use of physical methods in food processing is not new. And if we go back to the cave uh, and, and we compare it to current times, the physical methods that were used to preserve foods in cave times were things like heating, using fire, and later on boiling. Cooling was also used by people who lived in cooler climates, and drying was used by people who lived in warmer climates. And while significant evolution has occurred in heating and cooling and drying since cave times, uh, if we analyse the contents of our supermarket trolley today, while you certainly find some fresh produce, you'll also find a significant number of products that are preserved by the same physical methods, namely heating, cooling and drying. Therefore, while significant evolution has occurred in how heating, cooling and drying are applied to foods, no silver bullet technology has emerged to displace these physical methods. 
So physical methods are very important in the transformation of raw materials into food in an industrial setting. I'd now like to make the point and compare briefly domestic and industrial food preparation. And I'll start with industrial. And if you look around the, the, this diagram or this slide, you can see here, if we start up in the upper left hand corner, you can see the methods that are used for, for processing foods include heating, where the product is static or there's no mixing. You can also have heating where the product is mixed during heating. You can have size reduction. You can see those potatoes being sliced to form potato chips. Um, you also have freezing. Uh, you have emulsification uh, or, or blending. You have centrifugation, for example, in, in, you know, for salad leaves, for, for taking off wash liquid. You have separation of eggs. You have filtration. You have drying or dehydration of pasta. You have evaporation or, or reducing, as we're more familiar calling it in, in domestic terms. And also you have freezing. And these physical phenomena, phenomena that you see here, they're all used in the home and I can superimpose on top of those the appliances that are used uh, domestically to impose these physical steps. I suppose the big difference between industrial and domestic scale is, is firstly the scale of operation. If we look at this commercial potato slicing unit up here on the top, it processes 50 tonnes an hour. This small handheld unit certainly wouldn't process anything uh, like that uh, number of, of potatoes. Or if we look at this egg separation system down here on the bottom, it'll process about 15,000 eggs an hour, whereas the handheld unit certainly will do nowhere near that. I suppose the big difference or another big difference uh, in, in domestic and, and industrial appliances is the complexity and cost of the industrial compared to the domestic, but also the control. The control of, of industrial systems is so much more refined and so much more sophisticated uh, than you'll find in, 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 in domestic situ uh, situations. The next point I'd like to, re to make relates to the image of processed food. And processing does a lot of good things and we'll outline those to you in a minute. And it's been around for generations and it's a well-regarded and well-respected term. But in recent years, you see this type of imagery, uh, you know, reasons never to eat processed foods again, cut out processed food in 14 weeks, the little known dangers of processed food, processed food also almost ruined my life, eliminate processed foods, and this tape here with the caution around uh, you know, the, the, the fact that it, it, it's a food product. And that at a level, at some level is certainly very uh, misleading because really everything we consume is processed at some level. And you know, if we look at these fine wines or fine cheeses that you see up here uh, that people you know, would spend significant amounts of money on and so on, they're processed products in the same way as these healthy products that you see down here, in the same way as these uh, prepared fruit and vegetables, they're all processed at some level. So everything we consume uh, is processed at some level, um, whether, we, whether we like it or not. And the IFT or the Institute of Food Technology in the US have even gone as far as, as, as preparing what is really a very nice thought-provoking video on this whole topic. And in that video, they show what the world would be like in the absence of food science and in the absence of food processing. And if you take the time to have a look at that video, it's, it's on YouTube, it really does paint a very big, a bleak picture of the dietary choices we would have in the absence of, of food processing. In terms of the benefits of food processing then, um, I'm just going to, to make a few points on that. The first area is, is in terms of palatability and sensory improvement. And on the right hand side here, we can see a beautiful loaf of bread. And to me, it looks very, very palatable and looks, I imagine it would be very tasty as well to consumers. And if we go back a step and look at the main ingredient involved in the production of that product, um, it's flour. Uh, indeed, and water and salt and yeast and other ingredients are also added. Uh, but if we compare that flour to the, the loaf at the end there, there's quite a lot of steps involved in between the, the, the two points. So from the ingredient to the, the loaf that you see there, quite a lot of, of steps involved. And unless you're a very skilled uh, baker and so on, it's unlikely that you would reproduce the same result as, as what you see on the right hand side here. We can go back one step further from the, from the uh, flour back to the wheat from which the flour is produced. And in ancient times, that would be your starting point. You would, you would harvest your wheat if you were lucky enough to have some, and then you would grind it down to, to form flour. And, you know, looking at the steps involved in the transformation of this wheat into flour, again, there's a significant number of steps involved. 
Another quick example is these smoothies that you see here. Again, they look very palatable. They certainly look very tasty to me. Uh, they start off as whole fruit, but again, their transformation involves a significant amount of steps uh, to, to, to ensure they're transformed from the raw fruit into the product that you see in the bottle. There are many other examples of, of, of products which their palatability is improved uh, from processing. These ready to eat cereals that you see here, uh, you know, are, are, are certainly one example. An oldie, but a, a, you know, a, a very favorite product is our baked beans, which again, uh, the texture and uh, consistency of them is very unique to the process to which they're exposed. You have these, uh, you know, these luxury products that you see here, and you also have these very tasty looking, uh, you know, healthy uh, snack type products and so on uh, that, uh, you know, again, their palatability has benefited from being processed. The next point is just something I'm going to mention very briefly, and it will be dealt with in more detail by Breach, but it relates to uh, the preservation of nutritional quality. And I suppose in, in what would be an ideal world, I suppose we'd all grow our own vegetables and harvest and consume them immediately following harvest. And I suppose at that point in the immediate post-harvest period, they would be at their peak in terms of nutritional value. Now this graph takes an example of, of garden peas immediately post-harvest. And the green line you can see is out at the edge, indicating that it's really at its max level in terms of all the nutrients that you see listed around the, the circle there. Now, for those that have, you know, harvested uh, garden peas and so on, they're delicious if you, you, you grow them yourself at home and so on, and they're very nutritious and so on. But really growing your own produce is, is really uh, a great idea in theory, but for many of us, it's very, very time consuming. And, you know, there's a seasonal aspect to it, and it's really not as easy as it seems in practice as well. So the majority of us really purchase our fruit and vegetables in, in the supermarket or in the shop, and we bring them home and we store them at home. And from the time in which they're harvested to the time in which we consume them, there will be some deterioration in their quality and in their nutritive value. Now, if we look at, you know, again, a positive example on this front, again, staying with the garden peas, uh, you know, we, these garden peas are frozen immediately post, uh, post harvest. And if we compare the nutritive value, they pretty much line up pretty much with the exception of a small loss of vitamin C from a nutritional perspective, they're every bit as good as the freshly harvested. So I suppose, you know, you, you could cook these and, and denature them and so on, but if you consume them in the, uh, you know, immediately, you know, having thawed them from the pack and so on, nutritionally, they're on a par with the freshly harvested. So overall, the take home message is that freezing preserves and stabilizes the nutritional value more or less in its freshly harvested state. The next point I'd like to make relates to the balance between what we call heat liability and really what I'm saying there is nutrients that are degraded by heat versus bioaccessibility, accessibility, which again is a very, sounds a complex term, but it's really nutrients that are released by heat. And if we look at it here um, and, and take some examples, just two quick ones, um, broccoli and watercress, they contain things like glycosinolates, which have potentially anti-cancer potential or garlic has allicin in it, which is a health promoting compound. These compounds are, are, are heat labeled, so uh, they can be denatured or degraded by the application of heat. So for those types of products, if you want to get the max benefit in terms of those uh, bioactives, it's best to either consume them in a reasonably raw state or in a mildly heated state. By contrast then, if we compare uh, carrots and asparagus and tomatoes, uh, these products actually benefit from a bit of heating, uh, you know, because uh, essentially heat breaks down structures and makes compounds more accessible in the digestive tract. And there's a nutritional benefit from actually heating those products in terms of things like beta carotene or ferulic acid or lycopene, which are essentially antioxidant compounds. So, you know, heating those products, as I said, makes those more bioaccessible uh, to us in, 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 our, in our gut. The next benefit of processed foods is, is the area of preservation. And by preservation, I'm really referring to, to two things. I'm referring to uh, safety, but I'm also referring to uh, spoilage. And if we take heat as an example, looking on the left-hand side, we see uh, products that we purchase maybe on a weekly basis in, 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 in the local supermarket or whatever. We can see we have, uh, you know, we've got cooked ham, we've got pasteurized milk, 
We've also got UHT milk, uh, which, which would be, maybe would encounter more in restaurant settings or so on. But essentially these products are all heat processed, you know, with, with various combinations of time and temperature and so on, with the objective of, of eliminating the nasty bugs, the pathogens that make us ill and make us sick. The other reason why we heat process products in addition to, um, to, to uh, pathogens is, is really anti-nutritional compounds that may be present. And examples of products that do contain anti-nutritional compounds are things like kidney beans or chickpeas. Uh, they contain compounds which are, are not good for us. Uh, kidney beans contain hemagglutins, which cause red blood cell clumping. Uh, you get latrogens and chickpeas, which disrupts collagen structure and so on. Uh, and, and so these compounds are not good. Uh, they're anti-nutritional and are not good for us. So a heat process will certainly inactivate those as well. The other benefit of heating, of course, is, is leaving safety aside is, is the shelf life because uh, products do spoil in storage uh, and, uh, you know, enzymes and so on uh, do lead to deterioration and so on. So, as I said, using heat will, will um, eliminate these bugs that cause spoilage or that enzymes that cause deterioration of, of, of products and so on. So essentially heating inactivates or denatures products that are either anti-nutritional or, or make us ill. You will get some residual chemical activity going on in the background. That's why most of these products have a shelf life. But another quick point I would like to make is, is the control of industrial over domestic. And, you know, there's an awareness and a knowledge in, in food manufacturing that, you know, you certainly must eliminate the, the bugs that are going to make us ill and so on. But there's also, with the control systems available, there's also potential to minimize the risk of, of nutritional damage and, and quality deterioration and so on. So with the control systems that are used in processing, it, you're in a much better place to, to balance out uh, and, and, and reduce the, the possible negative impact, much more so than you would be in a domestic setting. The next area, and I'll just quickly touch on it, is uh, the other two main preservation methods that are used, namely freezing on the left-hand side and uh, dehydration on the right-hand side. Again, their targets really are focused, again, on pathogens and spoilage bugs uh, and enzymes and, and chemical reactions and so on. I suppose the big difference between them and heat is, is they really are designed more to slow down or retard uh, these bugs from growing or enzymes from reacting and so on. So it's a retardation rather than an inactivation. I suppose that's the key difference. The next benefit then of processing really is, is, is really one of convenience. Um, again, if we look at the smoothie that you see down here in the lower right hand corner, it's certainly very convenient. You simply open the lid and you can drink it and consume it and so on. Um, you know, if you want to make it yourself, you can buy uh, prepared, uh, you know, uh, chopped up uh, fruit and so on. And that's certainly convenient as well. Not as convenient as, as, as the ready prepared one. Uh, or you can go right back to the fresh fruit and cut it up yourself, which is less convenient again. Or you can go one step further and go back and, and literally go out and pick it from the, 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 the tree if you happen to live in an area where uh, that type of, of, of product grows. And the same goes for for many other examples. You can see this loaf of, of brown bread here. Again, looks a, a very tasty uh, product. Uh, you could make that product yourself, which is less convenient. Uh, you could go back again to, as I said, the wheat and mill the flour and make your own flour. Or you could go back to, to harvesting the grain, which would, would have been what would have had to happen back in, in ancient times. And finally then chicken as another example, you see this ready to eat uh, chicken breast here, which you can simply, uh, you know, put in your sandwiches or whatever, uh, or you can buy a, a chicken fillet, which again is very convenient, but you have to cook it, or you can buy a whole uh, chicken, which again, you have to cook, which is less convenient than the chicken fillets, or, you know, as would have been the case in, in times past, uh, you know, none of those options would have been available to you. And, and the, the only option you would have had would have been to, to purchase a live chicken and, 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 and um, prepare your product in that way. So before I hand over to Breach, and the, the final uh, point I'll just make is really before we had the food system we have today, uh, we were very much dependent upon locally produced uh, produce and our diet was very much dictated by seasonality and so on. Now, thanks to processing, we have much greater variety in our diet. We have a lot more healthy options to choose from. 
Uh, and we've also got the, the possibility of, of, of consuming uh, some premium products that wouldn't have been available to us from, from overseas. I suppose the only downside of this is that, that sometimes guest press is really the transportation of these uh, produce and so on can have, you know, certainly food miles associated with it and so on. But uh, as I said, the, the, the benefits in terms of variety in our diets uh, is certainly very, very important. I now hand over to Breach for the second half of this presentation. Thanks, Jim. Okay, so for the next few minutes, what I want to go through and consider really is the nutritional components of processed food. Um, so if we go on to the, the next slide. So without a doubt, I suppose, when we think about the processing foods, it can change the nutritional quality of foods, but that can have a usually beneficial effects. And for the purpose of this presentation, I'm going to look at it in three ways. It can have an effect um, just by the processing of it. Um, it also can have an effect due to fortification and also reformulation. So if we start with the processing of the product itself, and Jim has already touched on this, but I suppose um, just to, to go over it again, when we think about our fresh vegetables versus our frozen vegetables, um, and again, we have peas here, it can be that frozen vegetables do have a higher value of vitamins and phytonutrients and phytonutrients being the chemicals, the natural plant chemicals, um, such as lycopene um, that is found in tomatoes. And again, when we look at the fresh tomato versus the canned tomatoes, the canning process, um, so the heating and the canning process can make that uh, lycopene actually uh, more bioactive and therefore a better option when we think about it in terms of canned versus fresh. So overall, the processing itself can have a beneficial effect. Next, if we think about the reformulation, so, or sorry, fortification. Um, so fortification is um, whereby we actually um, increase the content of essential micronutrients. Uh, deliberately, we do this um, in food. And really it's to improve the quality of food, but also to provide a public health benefit. And again, this has been done throughout the years. So we could data back and look at um, when iodine deficiency was rampant across Europe and they've actually decided to put iodine in salt and that increased the intakes of iodine and eradicated iodine deficiency. Um, but if we go closer to home and look at Irish products, when it comes to, for example, flour, we can see in flour actually iron, calcium, thiamine, niacine, and sometimes folic acid is added in um, at, at, into flour. And this has a major contribution in our diet. So if we look at data that we um, collected from our children or Irish children and look at the consumption um, of uh, bread, 18% of iron and calcium was coming from bread sources. So you can see that it can have a real impact. If we go further on and look at our adult population um, and looking at women, just in the next slide. So here, um, what you can see is a graph. Um, I'm looking at particularly three micronutrients, iron, folate and vitamin D, and I'm looking at Irish women. And here you can see um, the percentage difference if um, we consider fortification of these micronutrients and we don't consider fortification of these micronutrients in the Irish diet and the amount of women that would meet the estimated average requirement of these nutrients. And if we look for iron, for example, with fortification, 19% more Irish women would meet the recommendation. And come in terms of folate, this would be 6% in terms of vitamin D, 7%. And if we focus in on iron folate, particularly for women of childbearing age, they're really important during them stages, especially in pregnancy, and um, that you have adequate status, especially for folate in preventing or reducing the risk of neurotube defects. We can go on a bit further and look at fortification in, com in, in terms of vitamin D. So vitamin D has obviously been very topical over the last year when it comes to, I suppose, COVID. Um, and this is data just coming from our preschool children when we looked at it. And it is a graph of their mean daily intake, their micrograms per day of vitamin D. And first at bar here, you can see from all sources, they are getting 2.7 micrograms per day. It is very low, I have to say. We would like to see an improvement in that. But what we can see, if we look at the fortified food sources, 
uh, 1.5 uh, micrograms per day of that was coming from fortified foods. So it has a huge role to play with improving our micronutrient intakes. But I suppose I can't be um, one sided in this story. So although we do want to outline the positive um, aspects of processing, we can't go by without saying that there are certain negative aspects as well. And that comes more so from what is added during that processing um, of the foods. So if we look at it in terms of, um, uh, for example, here, fresh meat and fresh pork to a processed meat, uh, in particular sausages here, what we know is the nutrient content does change so that there's higher quantities potentially of fat and salt in the processed meat compared to the leaner, fresher version. Um, also, if we look at the orange, for example, down here, if we consume an orange versus if we uh, bought an orange drink, uh, a processed orange drink, potentially in that processed orange drink, we're losing that fiber that would have been coming from the fresh orange and, orange and other uh, vitamins and minerals. And potentially there could be added sugar into that drink as well. And they can have negative consequences. However, what has happened um, over the past while, so if we go on to the, the next slide, um, Jim, is reformulation. Reformulation is, well, uh, is the process that we call um, in terms of changing a food's composition. So we reformulate the, the, the makeup of that food and it's usually done to improve the health profile of the food. And over the last number of years, um, industry have done a huge job in trying to reformulate foods to um, look at certain components in terms of salt, fat and sugar, usually the ones that are highlighted and trying to reduce the content um, or the amount that they use in their composition of the foods. And just to give you an example of how this works, if we go um, in to look at, at sodium in particular or salt, um, so we would get a lot of salt contributed from processed foods and in particular breads, processed meats um, and breakfast cereals and soups. But over the last 10 to 15 years, the industry in Ireland um, have tried to reduce the amount of salt that they use in their products. And that being said, what um, data here coming from the Food Safety Authority of Ireland has shown that, for example, if we look at breakfast cereals, and it varies depending on which breakfast cereal you look at, depending on if it's rice, bran or corn based or muesli, but there's an overall reduction between 38 to 63 percent. So that's quite a lowering. And that has had a direct really impact in the amount of sodium um, intakes in the Irish population. So we can see from um, the food consumption survey. So if you look back at um, when we reviewed adults in 2001 compared to 2011, there is a, a lowering of sodium intakes um, of about 1.1 gram um, in adults. And that um, is obviously the reformulation will have had an impact on that. Um, so it is a positive. And if we go on to the, the next slide, I suppose um, in terms of reformulation, I, I can't go by without talking about additives. Um, and additives are used obviously quite a lot in, in processed foods. Um, they're not a new thing. They've been used actually for centuries. Again, if we go back to Egyptian times, they use them um, to improve the color of their food or flavor of their food. And likewise, nowadays we use them for preserving the freshness, safety, taste, appearance, and texture of processed foods. In foods, if they are to be used, they have to have a purpose in that food. And also it is um, important to note that they really go undergo rigorous scientific safety evaluation um, before they can be approved to be used in food. And they're continuously re-evaluated. And although we might look at the E numbers that we see sometimes in the back of packs and we kind of might go, oh, um, they look a bit alarming. E numbers is a way that the European Union really has classified the use of additives. So an E number means that it's actually passed this rigor rigorous safety uh, or scientific safety check. Um, it is permitted to be used. So sometimes we see these E numbers and it's just a, a, a way in which easier for manufacturers to kind of list the additives that they've used. And sometimes they'll use the name and not the E number. Um, but usually in the brackets behind or after it will give the purpose and the purpose. So common additives that we see, they're used for colors, preservative, antioxidants, um, emulsifiers, and thickeners and sweeteners. So we can see them a lot used in, in, in processed foods. And just to give you an example, if we go on to particularly look at sweeteners, because I think sweeteners come up a lot um, 
And especially, I suppose, with the reformulation that we've seen with sugar sweetened beverages and because of the, the sugar tax, we've seen that industry have tried to reduce the, the added sugar in, in their products um, uh, and they've started to use some sweeteners instead so that we keep that sweet taste, but we don't have, I suppose, the calories that um, would come with uh, the sugar. And that can have a beneficial effect in a sense if we are trying to maintain weight status or maybe reduce uh, weight and trying to, to reduce our calorie intakes. Again, I have to say sweeteners are continuously re-evaluated for their safety, but also we continuously monitor the amount of uh, additives within our diet. So this is work here we've done um, ourselves um, to look at the intakes of particular five sweeteners here that you might recognize, so sucralose, saccharin, aspartame, etc. And um, what we did was to look at the amount that are actually being consumed. And we look at it in relation to the acceptable daily intake. So the acceptable daily intake is set um, by the European Union in the amount that you can consume daily over your lifetime without having any safety issues. And if we look at it in terms of these or five particular sweeteners, you can see that it's actually all of them were less than 10% of this acceptable daily intake, or even some of them were less than 5%. So they're well below the safety threshold of causing an issue. So just to sum that up in relation to, I suppose, nutritional quality and processed foods, um, I can say, yes, processed foods uh, do have a beneficial effect in, in terms of nutrients and they can have be beneficial nutrients within them that can contribute to our nutritional intakes and have a positive impact. However, we can't disregard that some processed foods will have higher contents of added sugar, or added fat and added salt, and therefore these may be considered unhealthy. So I think it's really important really to evaluate the food's nutritional contents um, and look at them over a long term effect and trying to balance your diet by potentially occasionally um, uh, having them within your diet. And I leave it there. Thank you very much.